to the ABC Financial Intensive Series. I'm your host, Chantal Broderick. Our intensive shows are designed specifically to be like a short course, where you'll learn practical and detailed information throughout the episode. Our expert guest for this show is Mark Miller, the Chief Operating Officer of Merit Clubs. Mark has over 25 years of experience at the senior management level. He joined the Merit team in 2000 as Regional Fitness Director, responsible for all fitness, programming and operations. And since that time, he's moved into the strategic role of COO. Mark is responsible for all of the day-to-day management and operations of all nine clubs, the Merit Consulting Arm, MCM, as well as its new wellness division. As you will hear today, Mark's expertise lies in leadership and staff development, as well as revenue generation through both sales and non-Jews revenue programming, strategic operations and systems development, just to name a few. During this intensive show, Mark and I discuss what a leadership role should entail in a gym environment, ways to identify future leaders in your business how important it is for a leader to work in various departments during their training. Mark shares his thoughts on performance reviews and what they use instead. We chat about ways to develop leadership qualities in your team. And as always with our intensive shows, I highly recommend that you listen to it in full and then go ahead and download today's ebook. The ebook is a free download thanks to our friends at ABC Financial, and you can find it at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com under the intensives tab. We're about to get started, but first I want to say a huge thank you to our podcast partner, ABC Financial. To learn why top health and fitness facilities use ABC Financial to simplify their gym management and increase profitability, head to abcfinancial.com. Enjoy this interview with my special guest, Mark Miller. Mark, welcome along. I am absolutely thrilled that you're joining us on the show once again. I'm excited to be here. So I'm really excited about this topic today and we're going to break it down into four separate parts. And to start off with for part one, do you want to walk us through what your feelings are that a a leadership role should actually entail in a gym environment and what type of responsibilities should that leader have? Yeah, you know, so I... You know, when I was first thinking about this, this is a difficult one because leadership has a lot of different definitions. And the interesting part, at least in my opinion, is I don't think people fully see, you know, the health club business um, almost as a business at times. Like sometimes they don't realize how difficult it really is from the outside. They just think that it's a gym and people come in and work out all day and we don't do anything. And, you know, it really truly is a full fledged business. And I remember years ago, Will Phillips talking to me once, Will Phillips is the uh, founder of the Rex Roundtables, And, uh, you know, he said, you know, if someone who's leading in the health clubs, someone who really is a good leader and all that, and there are plenty of them. And if you just go back through your show, you've had numerous of the top leaders in this industry on your show with Joe Cerulli and several of those guys. And what you'll find is that, you know, anybody that is a leader there can also be running any other business and all that. So when I started to really look at this, I started to think about it a little bit differently. And I I think a lot of times there's that confusion between, you know, is it a management thing that's going on in the clubs or is it a true leadership, you know, and management is simply trying to check the boxes and get the tasks done in my, in my opinion, leadership is that next level of how do we set the agenda? How do we move the organization through the various stages, you know, from infancy to growth to maturity, you know, and keep it moving so that it continues to develop on the S curve and it doesn't become irrelevant, but you're constantly learning and growing and all that. And so, you know, I I think leadership is a lot more than just managing. I think it's setting the tone, it's setting the vision, it's managing the process, it's leading the way. And a lot of times it's setting the culture for the organization. And so I think from the responsibility standpoint, you know, there's a lot of factors that we have as leaders within this organization, you know, and 
um, the way I kind of look at it is I, I think of it sometimes as a beach ball. Mm-hmm. You know, on one side of it, you have a fiscal responsibility, right? You know, you got to obviously make money because you want the business to continue to grow and develop. But on the other side of it, you have to take care of your members. And, you know, customers in today's world are changing, they're adapting, they're learning, they're growing, they're, you know, they're working outside, inside, they're using apps, whatever it may be. And then you have employees who really are starting to look at this industry as a career. It's no longer a hobby. Now it's a career. And, you know, we've been blessed in in my clubs that we've had people who've been with us for, you know, we have one guy who's been with us for 42 years, but we have many people who've been here for 20 plus years, which is fantastic. You know, so you have the financial side, you have the member side, you have the employee side, and then you obviously have your ownership side. And each of those areas requires a little different level of leadership and how you move the organization forward. So I, I think there's a lot of th- factors in there. Mark, I love that visual that you've just given of that beach ball um, analogy because that makes so much sense, doesn't it? It's not um, one dimensional leadership. There's so many components involved. And as you talked your way through that, I thought that makes complete sense. And I totally agree with what you're saying in regards to I think if we looked back at our industry, a lot of people did originally go into it as something that they loved and maybe something that they saw as a bit of a part-time or a hobby. But isn't it amazing, isn't it exciting that so many people now are making a long-term career in the fitness industry? I think we're so lucky that we're starting to see um, more and more career opportunities emerge. And it is thanks to many of those great leaders that you mentioned that we've, we've had on the show over a period of time. Now, in your experience in in the years that you've been working uh, in the fitness industry, are there any ways that you would say that you could look out for or identify a potential leader within your organisation? Yeah, you know, I think that's that's a critical point for everyone to do that because you know, if, if I can go back for one second, if I go back to that beach ball analogy, mm-hmm. you know, when you're trying to fit into these different things, I remember Jocko Wilnick once talking about the command and all that inside of like some of his seal days. And there were times that you had to be the leader. And then there were times that you had to be the follower. And then there were times that you were kind of in the middle, you know, you had a little bit of both. And I you know, I think that's what you're trying to identify is these people who are coming up through the ranks and through the careers is, you know, we're now starting to get a lot of talent and this industry is changing. It's emerging. Um, you know, we're only penetrating 21 percent of the population. So there's still an opportunity for a lot more people to come into it. But there's also these avenues that we haven't even touched yet. You know, I was thinking about this the other day from a leadership perspective. And, you know, my brother in law. Um, about two years ago, he lost his eyesight. And, uh, you know, it's been a, a changing thing for our family to kind of learn how to deal with that. And I started thinking about it. You know, how do you deal with those types of populations coming into your health clubs? And so, you know, that's going to require a little different leadership. So when you when you sit there and you say, you know, how do we find and identify who the potential leaders are? I think there's both a science to it and an art, you know, leadership is both science and art ourselves, but I think you can look at it. You know, the science side of it is you have all the different assessments, right? You could do predictive index, you could do disc, you could do Wonderlick, you could do the color test. There's a lot of different ways and we use them. Whenever we hire any new employees, we always have them fill out some sort of profile. Um, but on top of that, I think the art of it is how do you start to see what I like to call the KSA of individuals, you know, the knowledge the skills and the attitude, because as you know, Chantel, leadership is more of an attitude than it is just of a skill because leaders have to be hungry yet humble. They have to be willing to learn and grow. They have to be willing to challenge the status quo. You know, at at times I like to say we're playing chess, not checkers. You know, checkers is the game that everyone plays. It's simple moves and all that, but chess is strategic. And, you know, sometimes you don't make, the greatest moves and sometimes you don't make the most popular moves. So um, for us, it, it kind of starts with identifying people who have these, these traits before they even become managers or leaders. You know, a lot of times we tell our people that you don't need a title to be a leader. 
when you determine a leader, you know, at first, I, I think the first part starts with fitting the needs of your club. You know, you have to kind of look at your club. You have to look at your team and all that. You have to kind of think about the team and the club needs. Go back to that beach ball. What is it that your club needs in this stage of development? Does it need better communication? Does it need someone who can hold people a little bit more accountable? Doing it in a positive way. Does it need someone who can set the vision? Does does there even is there even a vision? Like, what's the culture like? Because each of those is going to require a different type of leader. And then the next thing you got to look at is, can this person grow and adapt over time? Because what you don't want to do is hire someone for a role and then eventually the role bypasses them. It's that old Peter principle, right? People rise to their own level of self and competence. So how do you find people who can continue to grow and adapt as the organization grows and adapt? Then I think you got to look at, you know, some of the soft skills, you know, how are they a communicator? Um, what type of individual are they? You know, will the team follow them? You know, can they set a vision and can they create clarity around it? You know, do they, do they work from the why um, or are they more about the what and the how? And, you know, for us, we kind of try to move people through kind of a program for when they first get hired. And we try to use that time to assess them over time with regards to their leadership potential. Can you tell us a little bit more about that program? Yeah. So we're very picky in hiring. We believe that you take long time to hire and you're quick to fire. Um, although in our organization, we don't really fire quick because, you know, we, we like to give people the benefit of the doubt. And what we've learned over time is sometimes we hire the person for the wrong role, mm -hmm. but they're still the right person, if that makes sense. Yeah. So we take a person, we bring them in, we think that they're going to be this great salesperson. And we find out that they're not really a salesperson, but what they are is an unbelievable integrator. They could integrate people and connect them to dot, you know, to things and, put them into places that no one else can. And so, you know what, we just change their roles, but our process starts with the hiring, you know, so we, we have a whole hiring process that we do. And then when you get hired, we believe that onboarding is as critical as hiring. And that onboarding process is where the leadership development begins. So we go through 30, 60, 90 day developments with all of our employees and we have narrative reviews and sit downs. And we just want to make sure that we're, you know, we're teaching them, what the company does, how it does it. And we're starting to learn a little bit more about them. Like what are their wants, their desires, their career aspirations. And we believe that we have to be looking at it from personal business and family, because if we understand the person as a whole, then there's a lot more potential. Like we, we have some people who are managers that are also great, you know, little league coaches and they lead our, family clubs into markets that we never thought possible because they just understand it. But from the 90 days, everyone at the end of 90 days gets what we call an individual development plan. And so the objective is to kind of help this person move along whatever path they want to, they want. So some individuals want to come here and they want to grow with the organization. And our philosophy is we want to hire 70 to 80% of all of our managers from within the company. We want to kind of groom our own talent. So from there, we have people that can move into a manager and training program, a manager on duty program, and then we have a leadership academy that they can move into. In addition to those things, we also do what we like to term a 401 training, which is we do outside development stuff. So how to buy your first home, how to do basic odd and ends around the house, how to declutter, how to manage money for your future, all these different things, communication. Um, and we offer those free to our employees. And a lot of times the people who come to that shows us that they have a desire to learn and want to grow. And so it's kind of that like outside test to see if they want to come to it. And we offer it numerous times throughout the year. Then from there, if they get into our leadership Academy, we obviously try to mentor them and put them into kind of a development program with one of our other managers. And we have at any given time, we have two general managers in training, which are really just, two individuals that we are taking through and they're learning everything about our six systems that drive our organization and how to do it. They're in the meetings, they're running meetings, they're working with the general managers at the various clubs, learning everything they possibly can about the organization so that if we have an opening, they're the next 
group to come in, or if we find another club that we want to add to our portfolio, then we have someone waiting in the ranks that can take over that club. Hi everyone, just jumping in quickly here. I feel as though that 401 training, the outside development initiatives that Mark just mentioned, must be a great way to increase employee engagement and satisfaction. So I asked Mark to go into a little bit more detail around the programs that they offer. Here's what he had to say. When we first started it a couple of years ago, we started with three and then we moved it to five and now we're up to about seven a year. And, you know, it it ranges like we just did one on basic electric work and carpentry in your house. We had one on emotional intelligence. We had one that was just for the millennials, mindset and money, which was interesting. You know, I wanted to send my daughter to that because a lot of times they they don't understand that if they start, you know, taking care of their finances now, it sets them up for life. And so our philosophy has always been, you know, we want to coach the people it's not a work-life balance. It's a work-life integration. Mm -hmm. And we have to figure out how to teach them skills because even if we lose them, you know, our philosophy has always been kind of like that saying, you know, if you, if you train them and they leave, some people worry. And we always had the opposite philosophy. Well, if we don't train them and they stay, then we got a bigger problem. So for us, it's all about training and development. And our philosophy was if they leave, we want them coming back or people saying, man, you know, I just talked to Chantal and she said that she learned this when she was working with you. And, you know, we never thought about learning that stuff. Unbelievable, you know, and so we want we want to come work for you guys. And so for us, it's kind of like building the place that people want to work. Oh, I love hearing you say that, Mark. I think it's such an important progression um, for many businesses to be in that mindset of thinking about uh, helping their employees, regardless of whether they're in the business or, or leave the business or move on from the business. You know, over the years and, and with a number of the leaders that I've spoken to on the show, one of the things that does come up quite frequently is the fact that a number of them have worked in different roles within the organisation. So they might have spent a little bit of time in sales, a um, little bit of time in administration, perhaps they've worked with group fitness. How important do you think it is for a leader to have had a taste of all of the different departments within an organization and then I guess the the flip side of that is do you think there's any danger in promoting someone um, within their you know within their individual silo so like promoting a salesperson into a sales management role or a PT into a PT manager role what's your thoughts on that? Well, let me answer the last one first. Mm -hmm. So I do have a concern about promoting sometimes your best performer into the manager role doesn't mean that it's impossible to do, but sometimes the best performers, you know, a performer, and that's what they are. They're not necessarily the manager or the leader, and they don't always do things by the book. They just seem to know how to do it. It comes natural to them. You know, it's kind of like, you know, sometimes if you take your best athlete and you try to make them into the coach, they're not very good coaches, but sometimes, you know, one of the athletes that might be sitting on the bench becomes the greatest coach. Um, because they understand the game a lot more, which I think leads back to your first question, which is I'm a very firm believer that you hire a person for their, basically their attitude and, you know, the fit of your organization, and then we can teach them anything. And our philosophy has been, we want to make our people well-rounded. We don't want people to be perceived as, oh, you're just a salesperson, or you're just a regional manager of housekeeping. And in our world, our regional managers could basically go in and run any club, whether it's our maintenance director, our housekeeping director, you know, they could walk into a club and they know what questions to ask for sales. They know how to drive sales. They could go in and start talking about personal training and we'll use them when we do consulting with other organizations if we feel that they're the right person to help with that. We try to teach them anything and everything. Now, they have a specialty, you know, so we, we don't try to make a what's, – what's the saying? You don't try to make a squirrel into an eagle, right? You know, so we don't try to make them into, you know, that the best salesperson in the world, but we want them to understand enough that they can lead it through proper questioning, guidance, you know, positive leadership, things like that. So I think if you did hire someone who you felt 
has the potential to be a leader and then you taught them to be well-rounded because I don't think that as a leader that you can just come in and run it because health clubs are, they're dynamic. They're fast moving. I mean, we're 24 seven clubs. We don't ever close um, except for Christmas day. So, you know, our leaders need to understand a multitude of everything and, you know, they don't have to be the best at it, but they have to at least understand it. So we're very firm believers as part of our onboarding and launching that our managers and leaders, they work basically in every department. They will do a four hour shift in the kids zone. They will do a four hour shift at the welcome desk. You know, they will do a results appointment. They have to sell a membership. They have to take group fitness classes because we want them to understand the dynamics of what happens in there. They don't have to be the experts. We have experts in our department heads and our other leaders, but they have to at least understand it so that they can start to think differently and not get into a one dimensional thinking because we want to be able to think outside the box. And we also want to learn from outside the industry. So we also have that as part of their launching. Thank you so much for going into the detail around that, Mark. I want to move on to performance reviews and kind of dive into this area in a little bit of detail. I'm keen to understand what you would suggest we should look for when it comes to performance reviews for the leaders within our business. So, you know, that's a funny question because we don't do reviews. Um, Uh Yeah, we got away from them. God, 10 years ago. Um, Part of it is because, you know, it was always that uncomfortable conversation. You know, I'm going to rate you on a scale of one to five, three being that you did your job well, five being that you did everything exceptionally well. And we all know no one's a five because no one ever does a hundred percent exceptional. So what ends up happening is you rate someone a 3.5 or a three and they get all mad at you because they think it's middle of the road. So what we did is we kind of moved away from them and we found that if we're truly going to be leaders and we want all of our employees to act like leaders, we want them to act like owners. Um, so we do what's called reflections and our philosophy is that leaders can have conversations and it's during those conversations that you learn a lot. And if you do it as a reflection rather than a rating, you know, you could find a lot more and you can also see if the person's open-minded because the challenge with, being a leader is you can't be closed minded. You have to be open minded because go back to that beach ball, right? We're all standing on a different spot on it. So we all have a little different perception or story that we're making up in our minds. And so what we want to do is understand the data from everybody and then try to make the best, most educated, most beneficial decision. So for us, that happens a lot of times in the reflections and, you know, it's simple questions like, you know, what's one thing that you think you did extremely well this year? What's one thing that you think we need to do better as an organization? And then you just sit back and have a dialogue about it and you have a conversation and you, you watch them and you listen to them. And, you know, if you don't think they're giving you the full details, you pry and you ask them to tell me more about that. And, you know, sometimes you get deep and, you know, you want to find out what's happening in their personal life, you know, and and what are their goals and objectives for their personal life and how we can tie into those to help them achieve those goals. Because if we do that, we're not only growing them as an individual, we're growing them as a family member and they're going to be more loyal. They're going to work harder and things like that. So we've really moved away from the performance reviews and into more of a reflection. That is so fascinating. And I love that you're really um, encouraging that conversation. So can I just ask how frequently do you sit down and do those reflections with your leaders? Well, so we do 30, 60, 90 days. When you first get onboarded, we, we have a conversation. Uh, it's a narrative conversation. Then we do, we give them a reflection sheet at the 90 days. And then we do it at nine months down the road. We'll have another conversation that does the reflections and all that. And then it's usually a year after that. Now, anybody who's in our leadership Academy, we're really meeting with them three times a year. And we have those conversations in there. Other than that, our regional managers are meeting with their staff on a you know, monthly basis, or they're sitting in their, you know, the GM's meetings and all that. And we'll just ask questions in the meetings a lot of times. You know, sometimes I've been known just to show up at meetings and just go, okay, guys, you know, what are we doing that's really well? What do you think we need to do more of? You know, um, I like to ask the start, start, stop, continue question. You know, what's one thing we should start doing? 
what's one thing we should stop doing and what's one thing we should continue doing. And I'm randomly ask all different people, even if it's one of our housekeepers or frontline people, well, not housekeepers, we call them care team members, but I'll ask anybody in all the time. Mark, I just love that reflection sheet that you've been talking about. And I'm keen to get a picture in my head of exactly what components of those questions are included. Would you be willing to just give us a quick run through of what's included in that reflection sheet? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So, you know, each sheet's individualized to the individual, but traditionally what we ask is the first part of the question is, you know, what's one thing that you're happy or excited that you achieved this year? And then the follow-up question is, what's one area that you'd like to improve upon in the next year? Then we do the exact same question only for the company, because we want to see if they're thinking about it from just their club perspective or our company perspective. So we ask them, what's one thing that you think the company should be really proud of that we achieved? And what's one thing that you think the company should work on to get better at? And that way, we're giving all of our employees a voice. And as, as you know, Chantal, the power of this sheet is within the art and the science of the person using it. Um, the next question is, what's one area that we should start doing? What's one area that we should stop doing? And what's one thing that we should continue doing? And, you know, again, we can relate it to them as an individual, and then we can also relate it to the, the clubs or the, the company as a whole. And then from there, we usually dial into like, what are three goals that you'd like to achieve in the next coming year. And then that way we can kind of dial in their um, individual development plan to help toward those goals. Or at the same time, we might say, well, we don't really think those are your goals. We think that you need to focus on X, Y, and Z based on what we've observed or what we have. And so sometimes you have to have that little crucial conversation then. But we find that having an open dialogue like this allows you to have that crucial conversation because you've created a lot more safe space with people. And you know, you're, you're no longer, you're not rating them. You're, you're kind of helping them to move forward in their careers and their growth as an individual. And when people know that you have their best interests at heart, they're willing to have those conversations. Team, as Mark was talking us through those reflection conversations, it made me wonder about if and how they build in pay rises for their team, given that often pay rises coincide with performance reviews. Here's what he had to say. So it's a great question. And, and a lot of businesses, what they do is they type bonuses into things like that. And so they use KPIs. We, we don't do any of that. We, we believe that when you set up a system like that, you incentivize people the wrong way. And what ends up happening is, you know, people can make their bonuses by cutting their expenses. And you could cut service, you can not repair things, and that's just not how we're going to operate. So we pull those conversations away and they become two totally separate conversations. So for us, the philosophy has always been you pay well, you take care of the individual. You know, we pay 85% of a family's benefits. Uh, you know, we believe that you take care of the individual and then they're going to want to work with you. And then when it does come time for an end of the year type of bonus, it's it's not based on a number of that. It's based on how we feel we did as an organization. And we have that conversation with our ownership group. And, you know, there are times that as an organization, we chose to make a higher investment, to add a little bit more debt, to do some capital things. And we don't feel that that should penalize our employees for that. So in those years, we, we might give them a bigger bonus because or a bigger end of the year gift, we call it, because we know that they're working hard and all that. You know, as far as it comes to reviews, I mean, raises, we, you know, we believe that, you know, we start the person off at a, at a good salary and all that. And then as they progress over time with us, you know, we obviously want them to make more money and all that. And so if the person is doing a good job and they're involved, we leave it up to our, our regional managers and all that to decide, you know, who gets what. We give them kind of a range you know, it might be a 4% overall increase in salary and they can choose, you know, do they want to give this person 2% and give this person 5%? And, you know, it's, it's a little subjective and sometimes it's, you know, did the person show up to all the team meetings? Does the person, 
you know, help out when we do company events or they do, they just come in and do their role. We're very big believers that when the company wins, everybody wins. So we look for individuals that take part in our outreach events and want to go help out, get outside their departments. Don't just stay within their departments. You know, do they help bring guests into the clubs? Do they get involved in our charitable charitable events and things like that. And, you know, that weighs a lot on our decisions on whether or not that person gets up an increase. Well, thank you for taking on that little bonus question that I threw you, Mark. I was very interested to to understand how that works. So thank you for answering that. So let's move into the final sort of part of our chat today. And I'm interested to understand any tips or any advice that you might like to share with us for developing leaders from within our business. And you mentioned that the majority of, of managers and leaders you get from within the business. Can you talk us through any tips that you might have, things that we can do daily, weekly, monthly, or quarterly to develop those leadership qualities within our team? Yeah. So my, my first one is I think you have to develop a culture of, you know, it, it's a culture of responsibility. Like in my mind, I owe it to my team. My job is to grow and develop them. Their job is to grow and develop our company. And so I have to take on that philosophy that I have to keep learning, growing and developing myself and then sharing that information with them. And one of the objectives I think that you're trying to do as leaders is to move from where you need to to train people to having people that want to train, that want to develop. Because I think when people want to do it, they naturally take on things themselves. And then you can kind of provide them the resources. And so, you know, a couple of the resources that I can think of off the top of my, my thing is, so you know, people learn from a couple different ways. They learn from the experiences they have. So the more empowerment and delegation that you can give, not dumping, but delegation, empowering a person to really run with something and learn from it and understanding that it doesn't have to be done your way and that you can do kind of an after action review afterwards and debrief about, Hey, what went well? What'd you learn from it? What would you do different in the future? And, you know, you got to trust your people. So you got to build a lot of trust in your organization, um, which kind of ties back into, you know, Pat Lencion's five dysfunctions. The second part is I think you got to have resources for them. So some people are readers. Some people want videos. Some people want podcasts, whatever it may be. You have to make these things available to your team. And you can't look at it as an expense. You have to look at it as an investment because when your team gets better, your organization gets better, the customers get better service, and you grow. And then lastly, I also think that it's a reflection of the people that are around you. And so I think Jim Rohn once said that you're a reflection of the five people you hang out with the most. So you have to remind people that who are they hanging out with? You know, are they people who want to help them grow? Are there people that want to learn them? So big believers in, you know, creating a mentorship program for your employees and how can you utilize that power to grow people? So I think those are, are simple ones. And then I think you have to make it part of your daily operations. So, you know, to us, when we have meetings, there's always an educational component or a leadership development component of it. And that could be a briefing report. It could be a presentation. It could be a YouTube clip. It could be a conversation. It could be really anything. We're just trying to share something at every single meeting so that we're constantly learning and developing and growing as individuals. I love that professional development piece, Mark. As you know, that's what we're all about and it's such an important message that we try and put out there in the world. So, Mark, thank you. I'm so thrilled that we uh, we had the opportunity to get you back on the show once again. It's been far too long between interviews and I'm really grateful for you sharing that, that information and your experience with all of us today. I particularly loved that reflection sheet. I think that's a really important one for us to have a think about and, you know, how how is it that we are um, reviewing or working with the leaders and the managers within our business? And do we need to re-look at those conversations and the way that we're doing that? And I love the reflection sheet because it encourages conversation. Uh, and I think that's really important in, in a people-centric business. So thank you so much for joining us today on the show. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.
Another huge thank you to Mark and a reminder that in addition to the podcast, you can now also download an ebook of today's intensive show. Just go to fitnessbusinesspodcast.com, click on the tab at the top of the page called Intensive, then scroll down and press the button that says access the ebook of this interview. It is that easy. Thank you all so much for joining me for this special edition of the ABC Financial Intensive Show. To learn why top health and fitness facilities use ABC Financial to simplify their gym management and increase profitability, head to abcfinancial.com. Don't forget we have a huge library now of intensive courses on sales, financial management, how to start your own YouTube channel, video essentials, how to start your own online personal training business, onboarding a new employee, and building a retention plan, plus lots more. You can find them all at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. Just go straight to the intensive tab. As always, I would love to hear what you thought of our latest show. Please email me at any time at chantal at fitnessbusinesspodcast.com. Thank you once again for joining me today. And remember, what you leave behind is not what's engraved in stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. Mm-hmm.